Hello everyone and welcome to this, our last lesson uh, for this mini project. Uh, in this lesson we're going to be talking about how to analyze your data from your device in Excel. Um, now this is going to be our last lesson, so our last uh, deck of slides, but we're still going to meet four more times. Uh, I just want to call your attention to this, that we are getting close to the end of the semester. As you can see from the schedule at the bottom of the slide here, um, next week we pretty much have two sessions where we just collect more data. Uh, hopefully you were able to get all the data you need um, during those two sessions, but even if you don't, um, we'll still have some time to collect more data on the following Tuesday, there on December 4th. Remember, that's the day where we're going to uh, practice your oral presentations. Um, so while one group is just giving me a quick uh, run through of their presentation, all the other groups can continue collecting data um, if need be. And speaking of those oral presentations, I'm going to post uh, some guidelines today um, to Blackboard for those oral presentations, just to give you a little bit of a feel for um, what kind of content should be included in there um, and, and what you should put on each slide. Um, but those are just guidelines. It's, it's ultimately up to you. And I'll give you some feedback directly there on December 4th. Um, along with that, I'll also post a rubric for the... Um, the oral presentation, so showing you how I'm going to grade it, and a rubric for your written report as well, um, which will be due on December 7th. So you come in on December 7th, ready to give your oral presentation, and you'll uh, submit your written report to me at that time as well. Um, so you'll have rubrics for all those things, and hopefully that'll be enough to, you know, guide you to uh, getting a good a good grade on both of those things. Um, but if let me know if you have any questions on either of those things. Um, also, speaking of grades, uh, you have one more homework grade left that'll be due next Friday. It'll be due, due next Friday at midnight. Uh, I did not send out that homework assignment yet. I will do it later today. Uh, I just didn't want any starting until we had this lesson. Um, but please let me know if you have any questions about that, either in class or at office hours or any other time um, via appointment. Okay, so with all that said, let's get rolling on this uh, lesson today. So first of all, let's uh, do a quick recap of what we talked about last Thursday, which was this introduction to enzyme kinetics. And there we said that <clears throat> what we can do is we can run these experiments where we uh, have a constant enzyme concentration, but then we vary the amount of substrate and what we find is that as we vary the amount of substrate, we get different rates of reaction. And this isn't too surprising, um, because if I start off with a low concentration of substrate, then it's less likely that the enzyme will interact with the substrate because there's less of it going around. So I get a lower rate of reaction for a lower substrate concentration. And that's something that's shown here on the plot here, where let's say S4 is my lowest substrate concentration. Nonetheless, though, I can still look at the initial rate of the reaction here. So over here in this part of the curve, the, uh, the line should actually be linear, and you can get a slope from that, and that's what we call the initial reaction rate, or V0. Or in this case, if I'm at substrate concentration S4, I get reaction rate V4. So if I do a bunch of these experiments, as you will next week, um, with beta-galactosidase and various concentrations of ONPG, you can then take those V's and take those S's and plot them onto something that looks like this, a michaelis mitten plot. And up here in the top right is the equation that we derived for that during our last class. So the initial reaction rate, V0, is going to be equal to the maximum rate of reaction, Vmax, times substrate concentration over Km, the michaelis mitten content, constant, plus substrate concentration. So you can see this uh, equation here, which is for a square hyperbola, uh, matches pretty well with the shape that's shown on the plot here. We want something that uh, shows that as substrate concentration increases, we get a corresponding increase in V0 all the way up to some threshold substrate concentration at which we reach Vmax. After that, we don't really see any further increase in V0, and that's where our Vmax is, <clears throat> as shown by that animation. So Vmax is where this curve plateaus. If you take one half Vmax, go down on the y-axis to that value, then go over the curve, down to the x-axis, that 
x coordinate or substrate concentration is Km, or the michaelis menten constant. So remember, these are two very useful values. Um, Km, first of all, tells us more about the substrate, or the uh, enzyme, and how it's interacting with the substrate. So does it have a high affinity or a low affinity, something like that. Whereas Vmax tells us the fastest possible reaction rate that we can obtain with this system. So if I know my Vmax, <clears throat> and I know the substrate concentration at which I get my Vmax, I really don't want to be any lower or any higher than that uh, value. If I'm higher than the, the uh, substrate concentration that gives me Vmax, then I'm not really getting any return on my investment. I might as well have this substrate concentration right here. There's really no point in being out here. The enzyme's working as fast as it can. Likewise, if I'm over here, then I'm just wasting time. The, uh, the enzyme's not working as fast as it could, so I should increase my substrate concentration to this value right here. All right. <clears throat> So, that's what we went over last time. You guys uh, did at least one experiment uh, during class that gave you something that looked like one of these green lines over here, probably S1 because we did the highest substrate concentration. Um, and so you got to see how there was a, a linear relationship there with the amount of product form over time. Um, but what I'd like to do today is really close the loop on all this. So you guys have your device. You know how to get data um, from the enzymatic reaction. But how do you get to Vmax and Km? All we've talked about so far is just looking at a michaelis mitten plot, like this one over here, and then guessing where Vmax is and estimating what Km would be based on that Vmax value. Um, but that's obviously a very rough approach. Uh, what we'd like to have is something more quantitative. Um, we'd also like to have a workflow that is almost automated for all of this. And that's where Excel comes in. Excel can help you analyze large amounts of data uh, to get outputs like Vmax and Km. So we'll, we'll show you how to do that here in a few minutes. Um, but that's really what we're going to try to do today, or, or in this lesson, is I'm going to walk you through the process of using Excel to analyze all of this data. And the hope there is that by the end of this lesson, you'll have this workbook built where all you need to do is put in these, uh, this raw data, and then Excel will tell you what Vmax and Km uh, actually are. Because that's what you need for your written report. You need to um, have that result right there. You, know, you need to show that your device works by giving me values for Vmax and Km. <clears throat> OK. So, before we get into that, I did want to um, just go over the example problem that was in the last slide deck, because we didn't have time to go over it on Thursday. Um, but in this problem here, um, what I had was I wanted you guys to compare two enzymes, uh, two mutants actually, the same enzyme, mutant A and mutant B. So let's say you took those two mutant enzymes, let's say these are two versions of beta-galactosidase, and you read, ran identical experiments with them. So you expose them to these different concentrations of substrate. So same substrate concentrations in both cases. But what you can see here is that the michaelis mitten plots for the two mutants look completely different. So that tells us right there that these mutants aren't equivalent. One of them is reacting faster than the other. It's going to be the one that has the higher maximum rate of reaction. So... <clears throat> If I wanted to estimate Vmax and Km from this data, um, what I can do is just look at the graph. So Vmax is going to occur wherever the, the plot plateaus. So you can see here for mutant A, if this line right here is 10 millimole per second, then I can go up to 11, 12 would be my Vmax here for mutant A. Now if I wanted to get the Km for mutant A, then I would take one half of Vmax, so in this case, Vmax is 12, so half of that is 6. So I can go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, come over to the curve, and then down to the x-axis. And I can see there that Km is occurring at 0.3 millimolar of the substrate. And you can see down here, that's what I have labeled as the answer. Vmax equals 12 millimole per second. 
and Km is equal to 0 0.3 millimolar. Now for mutant B, the story, the, the approach is pretty much the same, obviously, so I just have to see where the curve plateaus. That's going to occur at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 millimole per second, right there. And then for Km, I just take that 6 and half it, so 3, 1, 2, 3 millimole per second. Go over to the curve, go down to the x-axis. And you can see there my Km is 0 0.2 millimolar. So if I were to choose between these two mutants for my, uh, my process, for a plant or something like that, um, obviously in this case it looks like mutant A is going to be the better of the two mutants because it gives me that higher Vmax. I don't necessarily care too much about Km in this case, but I want to have that higher maximum rate of reaction because that means that mutant is going to be kicking out more product per time. So this is uh, pretty similar to something that I might put onto a test, for example. I might give you a picture that looks very much like this, and then ask you to visually estimate what Vmax and Km might be. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's actually go into Excel and start building a worksheet. Um, I have a few goals uh, for a few things that I really want to show you in Excel um, that are listed over here. So pretty much just showing you how to do basic math, how to make plots, and then analyzing those plots with trend lines, um, calculating slopes and intercepts, because we saw how that was useful, at least for the standard curve, um, and then also going into a little bit of statistical analysis as well, so uh, calculating averages and standard deviations. Um, so I'd like you to have those types of values in your uh, written reports. I don't want you to just say, oh, Vmax was exactly 100. No, probably not. I want you to uh, make I want you to conduct different replicates of these experiments so that you see that there's a little bit of wiggle room um, in the results that you get. If you do all these reactions on a Monday, all them on, again on a Tuesday, you'll actually get a different Vmax on each of those days. Now those Vmaxes will be very similar, but they will be different. And so uh, formulas for averages and standard deviations actually capture um, how much wiggle there is in those variables. And we'll show you how to do all that um, in Excel. Okay, <clears throat> so the first thing I'd like to do in preparation for going into Excel is to actually change our Arduino code a little bit. Um, so previously, we've written the uh, code to go straight into just the Arduino um, IDE uh, serial monitor, um, which is definitely okay as a, at a for a first pass, but it's also kind of cumbersome. Um, getting the data out of the serial monitor uh, can be kind of clunky, especially depending on if you're working with a Mac as opposed to a PC. Um, that can introduce complications. Um, and you end up saving all these files, importing things into Excel, so why not just cut out the middleman and go directly into Excel? Well, there's this program called PLX DAC that will allow us to do just that. And I'll show you how to use that in a minute. Um, but while we're changing the code, I'd like to change a few other things as well. So it, we had a few problems with the uh, if-else statement um, that we were using previously. So in this case, I just want to cut it out completely, uh, simplify the code that way. So instead, I want to remodel the code just to show, for example, the bit value. The bit value, and then we'll also report the... Uh, concentration of micromolar O and P. So that's what we were doing last week, right? Is we had the micromolar O and P was the main output of the program. Um, but also in anticipation of moving into Excel, uh, what we're going to do in Excel is we're going to create these plots that show the amount of O and P produced over time. And thus far, we've only really calculated the concentration of O and P. To do all these calculations, we need the amount, not the concentration. So <clears throat> we need to add a new line to the code that is this one right here. So nmol, uh, nanomol, nmol, O and P equals concentration of O and P, so this would be our UM O and P, times the volume of the reaction. So in those cuvettes that we were working with last week, we had 1.2 ml of O and P G and we added 300 microliters of beta-galactosidase. 
So that's a total volume of 1.2 plus 0 0.3 equals 1.5. So if we multiply our concentration in micromoles per liter times 1.5 ml, that will get us an amount. And that's what we need for these calculations. Um, but before we get into that, you got to notice here that if I do this calculation as is, it's micromoles per liter times 1.5 milliliters. So the units don't quite work out. So what I have to do is multiply this 1.5 ml times 1 liter over 1,000 milliliters. So that's a unit conversion right there. I know that 1,000 mils is equal to 1 liter. So I can put this uh, fraction into the, uh, <clears throat> into the equation, and that'll convert mils to liters. So pretty much 1.5 ml becomes 0 0.0015 liters. And then um, I'm also going to choose to go with the uh, nanomoles as my unit here. So in that case, I have a different unit conversion over here. And what it's going to do is it's going to change my micromole per liter units that I have over here to nanomoles. And it's the same kind of operation. I know that 1,000 nanomoles is equal to 1 micromole. So if I just have this fraction over here, that'll cancel out my micromoles, leaving me with nanomoles per liter. <clears throat> OK. So I want to put this equation into my code. That's going to give me nanomoles of O and P. And that's what I want to put into Excel, plot over time, to get my Michaelis mitten plot and uh, get my Vmax and KM eventually. Okay, but before, let's see. I know, let's just jump into Arduino IDE right now. So, this is what the new code will look like. You can see there's a lot of the same information, but let's just go from top to bottom through the whole thing. Um, I'll also post this code to Blackboard or email it out, whatever I need to do, um, to share it with you. Uh, because I'd like everybody to be working from the same code. I think at this point you guys have had enough chance to uh, fiddle around with the Arduino IDE, get uh, some experience with it. Um, but for the purposes of troubleshooting for the next few days, I'd, I'd like everybody to just use this code. Um, if you want to modify it, great. Uh, feel free to modify this in any way you like. Um, but I am going to share this with you guys. Uh, but just for the sake of uh, making sure you understand all the lines, here we go. So first of all, you'll notice I have a text line that starts everything off. This is just a reminder to me that the equations that are in this code are based upon a beta-galactosidase reaction in which I use a blue LED to get my standard curve. So that's going to be this uh, equation right here where I calculate micromolar O and P. That equation only applies to beta-galactosidase with a blue LED um, illuminating that sample. And this only applies to a reaction volume of 1.5 ml. So down in this line where I calculate my nanomoles, that's concentration times volume. Right now I have uh, UM O and P times 1.5. If I were to change the volume of the reaction, let's say I doubled everything um, to where I'm using 2.4 ml of ONPG and 0.6 ml of beta-galactosidase, yeah, beta I'd have to change that to 3.0. All right, so I got that reminder up there. Um, then I've got my variables, so I'm going to have time elapsed, um, the bits, the raw reading from the analog port, concentration of ONP, and amount of ONP. Then down here, we've got our uh, setup loop, so I'm going to open up my serial port, that's what this line is. And then I have these two new lines that I'm going to put into the code. So these two lines are required for uh, the Arduino to communicate with Excel via this uh, PLX DAC program that I mentioned. So there's two lines here that it's going to print. So it's going to start by printing clear data, and then it's going to print um, a line that pretty much tells Excel what each column of the worksheet should be labeled. So for example, I'm going to have the first column that's going to have a header that says elapsed time, and in parentheses, seconds. Then the second column will have this label, third column, fourth column, and you can do this all over and over and over again. Just separate all of your, uh, your text labels with commas. Um, you'll see in a minute here 
that this will just create an Excel sheet that uh, has these different headers. All right, and so we have to do all of that at startup. Then we go into our loop. And down here, the first few lines are exactly the same as they were before. So here we just have the runtime. So every time we take a measurement, we're going to increase um, the time by one second. And we know that for sure because down here, my delay for each of the loop steps is uh, 1,000 milliseconds. So there we go. We're going to have a time variable. Then we're going to have our bits. This is our raw reading from the uh, A0 pin. Um, in this code, I'm choosing to report that to Excel just in case something goes wrong with your device or your reaction. This will allow us to see every step in the calculation to see if, or to help us really troubleshoot what, what might be going wrong. All right, so we're just going to report everything to Excel. Um, so bits, there's the A0 reading, and then micromolar OMP. <clears throat> There's our calculation for that. And nanomolar OMP, which is just the concentration, times 1.5. And watch your units there. Remember, it's micromoles per liter for the concentration, but it's nanomoles for the amount of OMP that is created. At any rate, once we get into this loop down here, every time the loop repeats, it's going to add a new line to the serial monitor. That's going to start off with data, comma, and then the variables that we want to send to Excel. So notice these correspond with the headers that I have up here, the header labels. So I've got runtime, then bits, then micromolar ONP, then nanomoles of ONP. Okay? So overall, very similar to what we've uh, been doing before. It's just we're changing the way that all this appears in the serial monitor, and that influences the way that data is sent to Excel. Okay, so I'm just going to check this for the heck of it. There we go, compiling sketch, don't see any errors. All right, good. And then you would normally upload this to the device and check to make sure that it's uh, working there. You can also up open the serial monitor. I don't have an Arduino connected right now, but what you would see in the serial monitor would be the first line says clear data. Then the second line would say all these labels. Then the third line would be data comma these values. Then another, after another second, you'd see another line with all these, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's everything there. Now let's go back to this PLX DAC program. So if you click on this link in the slides, <clears throat> it'll bring you to this website right here. So this uh, Parallax company is a pretty nice uh, little site. They have a bunch of educational demos, things that you can do with an Arduino. Um, so, you know, definitely check them out. That's my little plug for them, since they made this uh, nice little program here. Um, but all you need to do is go to that website, left-click on this link, save the file. <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to save it. I've already got it. I'm going to save it again. There we go. So here's that file we just downloaded. I'm going to open it here in Windows. And this is the program that you need to install it right there, but it's inside of a zip file. So what we need to do first is come back here and right click on that, extract all, extract, and I've already extracted it so you wouldn't see this message, but I'm just going to replace all the files. <clears throat> there we go, and that went pretty quick, but uh, you can see here it's created a new file that's not a zipped file labeled PLX DAC. Okay, so if we come up here and we click on the installer, then we can go through all the usual button clicks. So yes, trust this publisher. And here we go. Next. Next. Typical installation. And then this might take a few minutes. And finish. All right, and once that's installed, um, what you should be able to do is go to your C drive and then in the program files x86 folder there should be a new folder that says parallax here we go now I could just as easily uh, type this in um, to a search or something like that look for the folder but it should be in C program files x86 there we go and then inside PLX DAC there should be this uh, spreadsheet right here. So this is what we need um, to interface with Excel. This is a um, specifically designed 
Excel worksheet with a macro in it and what it does is it looks at that serial port that we've opened with the Arduino IDE and then it takes in the data from the Arduino and uses it to populate an Excel sheet. So let's just open this up real quick and see what that looks like. So it opens just like a normal Excel sheet. But then you'll see this, uh, this window here um, that says, hey, you're about to open a macro. It's one of these ActiveX controls. Um, do you absolutely trust it? Um, yes, you do in this case. So just click OK. And then it's going to open up this window um, inside Excel. So this is the little macro, the little ActiveX control that allows Excel to communicate with the Arduino. Now there's a, a lot on here, but really all you need to worry about is the port here. So it doesn't actually know which port your Arduino is hooked up to. So you might have to go through here and just by trial and error, uh, try different ports and then see what actually connects. Um, but you might have to ma manipulate that and then you'll click connect. Now I don't have an Arduino uh, hooked up right now, but if you don't have, if you don't have the right port here, it'll show this error message. But when you do have the right port, then um, everything will turn green down here and you'll actually uh, start connecting or collecting data. Um, what else is here? This baud rate, remember we did serial <clears throat> in, the, in the code, let's see, let me pull it up here, serial.begin 9600, that's our baud rate. And you wanna make sure that matches here. 9600 is the default, but you can change that there and in the code if you really want to. All right, so if you hit connect and you have the right port here, then what it'll do is it'll change the headings right here and start collecting data. Now I don't have anything hooked up right now, but just to give you an idea of what that might look like, here we go. This is what your readout should look like when you turn on PLX DAC. Um, so you can see here that we've got our headers, and so those are the things that we programmed into the Arduino code, um, and you can change those if you want to, uh, but there you go. Uh, you might see something like this in the elapsed time column, and that's because this is the weird auto formatting of Excel. Um, it's trying to convert your, your one, two, three, four that you get for runtime into a time, um, but what you can do is actually highlight this column, right click up here, oops, and then click format cells. You can see right now it's in time mode, but if we go up to number, and we don't need any decimals because this is an integer value, so set that down to zero. Now we can see our seconds. So this is the elapsed time in seconds. And this is the real-time data that's coming in from the device. Um, so we start off here, let's say, at a, initially a very high reading, 873. And then as the beta galactosidase reacts with the ONPG, those readings go down. So what you're seeing here is the ONP forming. That's uh, decreasing the voltage drop here, decreasing the bits. <clears throat> and then the Arduino is calculating the uh, micromolar ONP using this equation up here and then we're calculating the amount of ONP nanomoles by multiplying micromoles by 1.5. Okay, so this is what PLX DAC does for you. It allows you to uh, skip the serial monitor and go straight into Excel. Um, but that being said, be very careful uh, with data that you collect in here. Every time you hit the connect button, it's going to wipe this data away. So what you need to do is go through one reaction and then copy this data right here. So this is what we really want, right? We really want the nanomoles of O and P for the rest of our analysis. So make sure you don't lose that data. <laughs> After you do a run, take this, copy it into a new Excel sheet, and then start a new run. Um, let's see, what else can we do here? Oh, one other cool thing you can do is you can highlight column A and column D so right now what I'm doing is I left clicked up here on column A, I'm holding down control, and I'm gonna left click on column D, I'm gonna go up to insert, 
and then choose the scatter plot and there you go it automatically then generates a plot for me that is the nanomoles of ONP produced over time or sorry the nanomoles of ONP in my cuvette over the time the elapsed time of the reaction and once you have this plot in here if you were to hit connect on PLX DAC again uh, the plot would stay in there the data will go away but as data come in to the Excel sheet it automatically populates this plot so you can actually watch this trend start to grow over time and so if it looks linear like this you know that you're doing something right uh, you know that you haven't reached that point where the enzyme starts to run out of substrate and then it starts to plateau for example now you're at this in this linear uh, regime right here and that's exactly what you want so yeah it's nice to see the data come in and make sure that you you know everything's going well okay <clears throat> so that's what PLX DAC helps you to do, helps you get this data. And now all I need to do is save this data here. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight these cells. And I would suggest that you save about two minutes worth of data. So two minutes would be 120 seconds. And that's what's shown over here. So I'm just going to control C that. And now I'm going to create a new worksheet. Well, actually, I've already created a lot of this worksheet, but I'm going to walk you through how I created it. All right, so um, that data that I just copied over, this right here, what I'm going to do is paste that into this sheet. And so I can't stress this enough. Anytime you're collecting experimental data, you should do your best to keep it very, very organized and well labeled. So in this case, in this sheet, what I've done is <clears throat> I've got my concentrations of ONPG. So this would be, let's say, millimolar of ONPG. And here's my time in seconds over on this uh, column right there. So this is all the data that you need to collect um, for the different concentrations there. Um, notice, though, that I'm giving you, uh, if you recall, uh, 10 millimolar ONPG, 5 millimolar, and so on and so forth, but that's not what's shown here. Now indeed, uh, this says 8, 4, 2, 1, etc. So why is this number lower than our substrate concentration that we actually used? Well, recall that what we put into the cuvette was 1.2 ml of 10, for example, millimolar ONPG. But then to that we added 0.3 ml of uh, the beta-galactosidase enzyme. So what that means, let me just change my formatting here because it looks like zero. There we go. What that means is that we have now a new volume that would be 1.2 plus 0.3. So what we've actually done here is slightly dilute the ONPG concentration. So in Chem 1, you may have seen this equation right here, C1V1 equals C2V2. So in this case, my C1 is actually equal to that 10 millimolar ONPG. My V1 is however much of that OMPG that I added, so that was the 1.2 ml. My C2 and my V2 then would be, well this is what I don't know. I know that I've diluted it, I just don't know how far. My V2 though would be my final total volume. So I can, I can actually solve for C2, that's going to be equal to C1V1 over V2. So that's going to be equal to, here we go, I just typed in equals in Excel, and then you can move this around with the arrows on your keyboard, or you can left click on that field right there. Then I need to multiply, so I'm going to hit shift 8 for that asterisk, left click on this field right here, so now I have the product of C1 and V1. Then I need to divide by V2, so I'm going to type in a forward slash then left click this V2 field down here. Hit enter. 
and there you go. Millimolar Owen PG. So that's the final concentration that's actually in that cuvette. It's a subtle difference, but it's an important difference. It's about 20% less than we thought it was, right? Or 20% less than what we started with. So you can go through and do this for every corresponding uh, ONPG stock concentration. So we have 10, we have 5, that goes down to 4. Then we have 2.5, that goes down to 2, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> That's where these numbers came from. All right, so anyways, in this example, I'm saying that I already gathered all of this data right here, and I just copy and pasted in uh, this data, for example. <clears throat> oh, but you might notice that it doesn't really look right. So it says here that we're getting different um, amounts of ONP, and it puts this new plot, or this new line, onto my plot down here that doesn't really look like it fits with the rest of the data. And that's because um, I actually made a mistake here. So when I tried to copy in the data from the PLX uh, software, um, what I should have done is, let's see here, I can copy this, so right click and then copy, or control C, either one would work. And then in here, what I should have done is paste just the values. So if I do that, now everything makes a lot more sense. Um, you can see now my, my curve is right there. It's where it should be. It's not off from the other ones. Um, so be careful when you're working in Excel. Unless you want to copy over equations, which is what this uh, sheet actually was for me, this uh, PLX DAC example. So this wasn't real PLX DAC data, I just had equations in here to generate that. Um, but you can see here that I had an equation that was defining these cells. If I copy these cells, I copy that equation. But if I just want the data, if I just want the values, then I copy this, go into my sheet here, right click, and paste the values. If you hit control V, it will automatically assume that you want the formulas. But if you right click, you can say, well, yeah, I do want the formulas, so that you see it's 358 back there. Or I just want the values, now it changed to 235. All right, so always be careful about that in Excel. Um, if you're copying cells, you're actually copying formulas that are there, not the numbers. If you just want the numbers, then right click and paste values. All right, so at any rate, now I've got this whole data table complete. That's exactly what I want to see there. All right, and this would represent, let's say, one of my runs. So I've gone through all the different standards um, for ONPG, um, and what I want to do is I want to repeat this two more times. So here's uh, one, one uh, grouping of those, then I'd have another tab here and another tab here for exactly the same experiments. They're just repeats of that. <clears throat> okay. Um, but within each of these replicates, uh, now that I've got this data, I can start to calculate those V0 values. So if I come back here to the PowerPoint, I can start to calculate this V1, V2, V3, V4 for S1, S2, S3, S4 to get a Michaelis Mitten uh, type of curve. So if I come in here, what I can do is, let me just wipe this clean. There we go. The slope of each of these lines is V0. So all I need to do up here is type in equals slope, and then type in my Ys. So that's going to be these numbers right here. And then I need my x's, so I'm going to type in comma, and then highlight my x values, which are the, the time values. Close that with a parentheses, and hit enter. And there you go. So this is my slope, which is also my v naught. Be very careful about the units here, though, because <clears throat> I know my y's are nanomoles of O and P, my x's are seconds. Now, I'm actually going to ask you to calculate v naught as nanomoles per minute. So to do that, what we have to do is create a new line here. 
so this is V naught nanomole per minute, and then in this cell beneath that 10.3, I'm going to type in equals, left click on that cell, asterisk, 60. So that's a unit conversion right there. I know there's 60 seconds in a minute, so to convert nanomole per second to nanomole per minutes, I multiply by 60, and there we go. This is what we actually want. That's our value of V0 that we want to plot against substrate concentration. All right, and then I want to make the same calculation for each of these other data sets. So what I'm going to do is highlight both of these cells, and then you see there's this little square in the bottom right corner. I'm going to take that and drag it across. All right, and what that does is it drags the equations across into each one of these columns. However, you might notice that I've got some data that look pretty weird. So I've got some negative values over here, so I might have just made a mistake. And indeed I did. Whenever I dragged this, these equations over, there's no problem with these equations, because all they do is they take the cell above it and multiply by 60. However, my slope function, that I have made a mistake in. So notice in this first column, what I'm doing is I'm taking the slope and I'm saying my known y's are in blue, my known x's are in red. But when I drag that equation to the right, then those columns went with it. So now for, let's say, this column over here, it thinks that my y's are what are directly beneath it and my x's are just one column over to the left. So you can see here how things are going wrong. I'm no longer referencing time as my x-axis. So what I have to do in Excel is actually lock those values in if I want to drag the formula across to new cells. So specifically what I'm going to do here is my, my y's, I do want to move as I drag that cell across, that formula across. It's my x's that I want to stay still. So to do that, I'm just going to type in a dollar sign so it should read $A5 and $A125. So that's going to keep this A value right here constant, even if I drag that equation across to the right. So let me show you what that looks like. So now I've got my dollar signs in place. I'm going to drag to the right. There we go. Now everything makes a little bit more sense. So you'll notice here, my, my formula says slope of the B's compared to the A's. Now it's C's compared to A's, D's, E's, F's, so on and so forth, but A does not change, and that's because I put those dollar signs there. And that would work with rows too, so if I wanted to drag this thing down, I would put dollars here. And so that means the row's not going to change for those, even if I drag this formula down. So you can see what that looks like there. But <laughs> that's obviously not what I want to do, so I'm going to control C that, and there we go. Okay, so now we have some V0 values. Specifically, it's these that I want to keep track of. So let's just copy those. And then I'm going to go to a new tab in my sheet. And this is where I'm going to make my Michalis mitten plot. So let's say I've already been through two replicates of the data. Here's my v naughts for different substrate concentrations. Now I'm going to fill in this third column right here. So to do that, what I'm going to do is control V, or actually not control V, remember, because that would copy over the equations. Now here, I'm going to paste just the values. All right, but I, I've run into a bit of a problem here, right? Uh, my, my data are spread out over across a row, but the rest of my data up here are in column format. So what I can do is actually control C these, so I'm just highlighting them with my mouse, then hitting control C. I want those values to come in up here. So what I'm going to do is right click, and then for paste options, there's this transpose option. I'm gonna click that, and looky there. So everything that was spread horizontally is now spread vertically. So that's much easier than going in and doing this manually, copying and pasting these values or transcribing them. Um, no, Excel gives you that option to convert um, horizontal data into vertical data. The only caveat for that, and I don't know why this is, is that you cannot cut that data. So if you cut it, hit Control-X, and then try to paste that in, 
it only allows you to paste. Maybe you guys know of a way around this, but um, I'm only able to make this transpose function work by copying. So hit Control C, then you can right click up here and paste our transpose like that. And then that just means you have to delete this errant data down there. Okay, so if we put that data in, now we can make a Macalus Mitten plot. So in this case, <clears throat> actually, let me show you how to make this plot from scratch. So let's say I wanted to make a new plot. I highlight my values over here for this column. And then I go to insert and scatter. And there you go. And if you click on these data, it shows you exactly what it used to, um, <clears throat> to make that plot. So it's taking A's here, this column A, that's going to be my X values, and then column B is going to be my Y values. And so I can come in here to this chart, and I can make that uh, more obvious. So I can add chart elements like axis titles. You always want to label your axes. Always, always, always. So make sure you do that. So I'm going to come in here and say nanimal, oops, nanimal, ONP, and then down here on the x-axis, this is going to be millimolar of ONPG. Oh, I'm sorry, this should be nanopole, nanomole ONP per minute, because that's my V-naught value. There we go. And down here would be my substrate concentration. And that's a Macaulay's Mitten plot. You can see here that we've got that square hyperbola. So the V naught values go up, 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 up until I hit a uh, threshold uh, uh, substrate concentration. And then the enzyme's working as hard as it can. I don't really get any higher V naught, even if I'm at a higher substrate concentration. Okay. Um, what I'd like you to do for your uh, written report is to actually take all this data from three separate runs and average that together to get the best possible representation uh, of this data as you can. Because let's say you're plotting this data, but it doesn't look exactly right. Um, maybe you've got an outlier that occurred during one of the runs, you know, something like that. Um, if you were to average these data together, it would smooth that out a little bit. So I want you to collect this raw data, <clears throat> but then calculate an average. It's pretty easy to do in Excel, so all you need to do is type in equals, the word average, and then highlight the things that you want to average together, and hit enter. There we go, now I've got an average, and I can drag that down, or I can just double click on the square that's in the bottom right hand uh, corner. So I can come in here to my plot, click on one of these data points, and it shows me what I'm currently plotting, and if you come over here to the blue data, then if you mouse over it until you see that crosshair right there, you can left click and drag that blue, that blue field, to these different columns. And what we want to plot here for your written report is what's in this average column here. So there we go. Now we've got the averages. So this is more representative of the uh, you know inconsistencies between different uh, runs. Um, but all we've done is plot an average, so I have no idea if this 631, if that's the result of some readings that were, let's say, 630, 631, and 632, or if they were the average of readings that were, let's say, um, 600, 630, and 660. I need to have a way to display that type of variability. And the way we do that most commonly is just with a standard deviation. Now there's a lot of different ways to do this, a lot of which might be more appropriate depending on different situations. I'm not going to get into that right now, but I just want you to know that standard deviation is not always the best way to represent that variability. So anyways, this is just one way to do it. I'm going to type in equals STDEV, open a parentheses, and then highlight that same data that we use for the average, close the parentheses, and press enter. All right, so what this is saying here is that the average value that I'm getting is 631. But really, there's enough error in those uh, readings that it could be 631 plus or minus about 47. 
So it could be 47 higher, up to 678, or 47 lower, down below 600. And so if I repeat that uh, calculation, extend that to all these other columns here, or all these other rows, you can show this uh, standard deviation on the plot itself by clicking the plot, going up here to Design, Add Chart Element, Error Bars, More Error Bar Options, and click on both, and then come down here to Custom, specify the value of those standard deviations. So I'm going to click on this box right here, then highlight these cells, hit Enter. For the negative bar, I'm going to have the same values. Highlight those cells, click Enter, and there we go. So now, you can look at each of these points and get a good feel for how much variability there is in each of these readings. It could pretty much be between the upper and the lower horizontal bar that's showing plus or minus one standard deviation. <clears throat> so I can visually inspect this plot and say, all right, these readings are pretty darn consistent. Um, if I had a bar that looks something like, let's see, this, 415, there's probably something wrong with that data point. Um, you might want to repeat those measurements or maybe check your math um, because that's highly suggestive that something went wrong with that measurement. Okay, so there we go. Now we've got our Michaelis mitten plot. And we could visually um, look at this and try to guess at what the VMAX is. We'd probably say it's around 600. There's a little bit of wiggle here in the plateau region, right? So I'm not absolutely sure what VMAX would be. You know, would it be 600, 601, 615? Um, I, I can't really tell. I have a feeling that it's around 600, but I can't give you a, a certain specific value. And if I can't give you a value for VMAX, I can't give you a value for KM either, because I could say, all right, if VMAX is about 600, I could come down here to about 300, come over to the curve, should intersect right about there, and then say KM's probably 0 0.75 millimolar, something like that, of ONPG. So I can get a feeling for what these values are, but I, I always want to have a very precise um, estimate for that. So let's go back into the PowerPoint slides now <clears throat> and talk about how we can get there. All right. So here's where we are right now. We've got the raw data, we can get the slope, we can get the V-naughts, and then plot those V-naughts against substrate concentration. And we get a plot that looks something like this. But we don't, we don't know exactly what Vmax is. That's where something called a haynes wolf plot comes in. Now, I, I do want to mention uh, there's another strategy to estimate Vmax and KM. It's something called linear regression. Um, and it's something that you probably should do. Um, but we don't really have time to go over it right now. I might go over it in class. We'll see. Um, but uh, linear regression is the best way to find Vmax and Km. Uh, this haynes wolf plot that I'm about to show you is somewhat of a shortcut. Um, it's an easier way to estimate Vmax and Km. And it lets me introduce you to a few uh, more tricks in Excel. So let's go over that. Um, so anyways, <clears throat> let's say I wanted an exact estimate for Vmax and Km. I can't get that from the michaelis mitten plot unless I have a lot more data points um, that go out a lot further. And, and, uh, and the curve looks relatively certain. Um, with a haynes wolf plot, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take that nonlinear curve that we got from michaelis mitten and we're going to linearize it. So this process is called linearization. And You'll see this a lot in different types of analyses because when you linearize data, then you can use a linear model, so something like y equals mx plus b, to estimate um, different constants, uh, different variables that are important in the system, like in our case, Vmax and Km. So anyways, what I want to do is I want to take this nonlinear curve right here, this v naught equals Vmax s over Km plus s, and linearize that. So I can do that by doing some algebra. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take Km plus S, 
and multiply both sides by that. And I'm going to take V naught, divide both sides by that. So that gives me Km plus S equals V max times S over V naught. <clears throat> now that I've done that, I can, <coughs> excuse me, divide both sides by V max. So V max is going to go way over here. I'm left with S over V naught. That's shown in red down here in the third line. Then I'm going to have S over V max and Km over V max. All right. So now I've got this colorful equation down here. And while it doesn't look like it, this is actually going to be a linear plot. And the reason for that <clears throat> is that I've put everything into y equals mx plus b form. And what that specifically means is that I have two variables, right? I have y and I have x. And I have two constants, m and b. So if you look at this equation down here, it actually is in the form of y equals mx plus b, even though it doesn't look like it. Because if I start with y, I've got s and v naught. Now those are both variables. They're going to change, but they're changing in the same term, all right? So y is allowed to change, which it certainly will, s over v naught. Over here now I have mx plus b. The b should be a constant, and surely enough, km and v max, those are both constants. So this value is not going to change. Over here, I've got s over v max, which is supposed to represent mx. So I'm allowed to have a constant here and a variable. So in this case, my variable is s. My constant would be 1 over v max. Okay? So if I plot the same data that I have for the michaelis minton plot onto what we call this haynes wolf plot, then I'll get a, a, a straight line. All right, And that straight line is going to have a slope, m. And that slope is going to be equal to 1 over v max. It's also going to have a y-intercept. And that y-intercept is going to be equal to km over v max. So if I plot this data, I start by getting the slope. That gives me v max. Then I get the intercept. Intercept is equal to km over v max, but I just calculated v max. So now I can solve for Km. So that's the power of the haynes wolf plot, is that now, no matter how many data points I have, they should all fall along this line. So even if I only have two data points, I can get a line and estimate Vmax and Km. Now, obviously, the more data points you have, the more reliable your estimates for Km and Vmax are going to be. But if I go back to the Michaelis mitten plot, if I had just two of these data points, I really couldn't tell anything about Vmax or Km. That's the beauty of linearization, is that I can do <clears throat> a much more detailed analysis with fewer points, or I can be more confident in my analysis with more data points, um, because I've done this linear transformation here. Okay, So uh, let's just go through an example of what this might look like. Because again, this is something that I'm going to ask you to do on the homework. Um, and it might pop up on a test. So anyways, let's say you've gotten this raw data here from an, an enzymatic reaction. You tested different uh, substrate concentrations, and then you measured these initial rates of reaction over here. <clears throat> you can take that data and make a michaelis mitten plot. But if I wanted to estimate Vmax, in this case, I can't do that at all, because it looks like I didn't collect enough data points to even see where the plot is going to level off. Because remember, Vmax occurs at the plateau. Here it looks like the data, or the, the V naughts, are still increasing. Um, so I don't have any idea of what Vmax is. However, if I take the Haynes Wolf approach and I linearize the data, what that's going to mean is, let's go back to our slide here, is I need my y values and my x values. So I already have x values, that's my substrate concentration. So my x's are the same for michaelis mitten and for haynes wolf But for y, now it's s over v naught. So that's what I need to calculate first. For each of these points here, I need to take s, 6, and divide it by v naught, 20.8. And I get 0 0.29. And then I repeat that calculation. 
So these are my new y coordinates. My x coordinates are still these. I can use those to make a Haynes Wolf plot, and you can see here now I get that nice straight line that I'm looking for. And if I have this straight line, then I can estimate Vmax and Km. So let's go through that process. The first thing I'm going to do is calculate the slope. So <clears throat> there's a lot of different ways you can do this. If you're just doing this by hand, pick two of the data points and uh, calculate delta y over delta x. So in this case, I've chosen my extrema. So 2.07 minus 0.29 over 180 minus 6. And I get 0.01 um, for that. Now be careful with your units. Um, this is a slope. And so it's going to be the reciprocal of Vmax, right? Because m equals 1 over Vmax. So it's micromole ONP produced under minute instead of over minute. Anyways, the next thing we do is we want Vmax. So Vmax is equal to the reciprocal of the slope, 1 over m. So 1 divided by 0 0.01 gives me 100. And again, remember your units. You want to include those. And it's going to be 100 micromole ONP per minute. And by the way, I know that these are my units because those are my units for V0. Vmax and V0 have to have the same units. So it's micromole per minute up here, micromole per minute down there. And we're talking about generation of product, so it's micromole ONP, not micromole ONPG, because that is the substrate. If you wrote micromole ONPG here, that would be incorrect. All right. So now we have Vmax. Let's calculate Km. So for Km, <clears throat> what we can do is simply plug and chug some values. So we have this equation right here, S over V0 equals S over Vmax, Km over Vmax. We can pick any one of these data points up here. Let's just say I picked the last one. My S over V0 for that last point is 2.07. My S is 180. And then I just calculated my Vmax, that was 100. So I put in 100 in the denominator of both of those fractions. The only thing I don't know is Km. So now all I have to do is solve for Km. I can multiply through by that 100, that gives me 207 equals 180 plus Km. Solving for Km gives me 27 micromolar ONPG. Now again, here, be very careful with your units. Km is the substrate concentration at which I reach half of my Vmax. So I know I'm going to have units of concentration here, micromolar in this case. Since S was in micromolar, Km must be in micromolar. And I'm talking about my substrate concentration, so that's 27 micromolar of ONPG, not ONP. If you wrote ONP there, that would be incorrect. Now, this uh, estimate here is going to change if you pick different data points. Um, not by much, but it will change. So just like we talked about when we are doing the standard curve, you can do these things by hand. You can manually put in these points to estimate the max and km. But if you have Excel at your disposal, then there's better ways to do it. So let's go back into Excel <clears throat> and look at how this might work out. So. I'm in my Macalus Mitten tab right here. I've got my Macalus Mitten plot. And, oh, by the way, if you really want to, you can connect these dots here. If I come up here to, let's see, where is it? Design change chart type. Really, all you should ever do is XY scatter with the points. But it makes the curve look, I don't know, just a little bit prettier if you put a line in there. You can really tell the, um, the shape of the curve a little bit better. Um, hopefully your curve looks a little bit better. It looks like I've got an outlier here or here. Um, but just FYI, you can change the, the type of chart by coming up here. And there's a lot of different ones you can put in. You can just put in a line and, and omit the data points. And what else do we have? There's bar graphs, things like that. Um, explore it. There's a lot of useful different ways to present data in there. All right, anyways, I digress. Uh, we were talking about Haynes-Wolf plots. So what I'm going to do here is create a new tab. It's going to be my Haynes-Wolf calculations. And to create this tab, pretty much I've got the same type of formatting as I do over here. 
So here's my millimolar zone in PG, because remember, my, my X coordinate is still S, still substrate concentration. It's my Y coordinate that changes. Now, that is this fraction, S over V naught. So what I can do to generate this data is say equals, then go back to my Michaelis Mitten tab and say there's my S divided by my value for V naught. And there we go. Now I've got S over V naught. And then I can drag this around. But again, be careful here. Notice something went wrong. I need to lock in certain values. So in this case, it is, how did I do this? I did A3 over B3. But as I drag to the right, it's going to drag all that with me. I want my V0 to move because that changes. But I want my S to be constant. So that was my A3 value. I'm going to put a dollar in front of that sign. That, there we go. Now I can drag that across drag that down. And there we go. Now I've got Haynes Wolf um, plot values. Now Oh, it looks like this is this plot is still pulling data from the other sheet. Let's just make a new plot altogether. What do you say? All right. So, if I've got these here, I can take the average of those values. There we go and take the standard deviation, STDEV, highlight all those, and bring those down. All right, let's plot those. So I'm going to highlight these values and my average values, insert, come up here to plots, scatter plot. There you go. All right. <clears throat> So you might see some noise here at the lower concentrations, but overall you can tell I do have a straight line. All right. And let's see, is there anything else to do? That's good. I'm going to change the title here. And I need to add my labels for my axes. I will take off points on your written reports if your axes are not labeled. Fair warning. All right, S over V naught there. And then this would be S. Alrighty. So now I have my, my uh, Haynes Wolf plot there. What I can do is come in here and create a trend line. So if I click on any one of these uh, labels here, I can go add trend line, and there we go. So that's my, my linear representation of this data. All right, you can see all of my points don't really lie on it. There is a little bit of inconsistency here, especially down at the lower concentrations. Um, but you're going to see things like this. You're going to see imperfections, and that is why we uh, do multiple replicates of these experiments, okay? Um, so we expect to see something like this. Don't worry if it's not perfect. All right, so at this point, I've, got a, I've actually got a few options. If I wanted to estimate the slope, I could come in here and click on my trend line that it just added, and it opens up this uh, box on the right side here. Now, notice it gives you a few options. Um, we're expecting to have a linear trend line, but if we wanted something else, uh, let's say exponential or uh, polynomial, um, we could select that here. Now, we just want a linear trend line, though. So Excel guessed right. It goes to linear by default, I think. And then down here, I can display the equation on the chart if I select that. And there we go. That's the equation for this trend line. So this is pretty useful because now, remember, uh, according to Haynes Wolf, uh, the slope is equal to 1 over V max. So I know that my slope is 0 0.0013. Likewise, my intercept, my y intercept, uh, 0 0.0021, is going to be equal to Km over V max. So that's pretty nice. I can take those values and do those calculations manually. Or 
I can get the same information by using the slope command and the intercept command. Remember, we did this in the Google Sheet. Um, the same kind of commands exist in Excel. So let me just show you. I've already done it here for column B, but let's do it for column C. If I type in equals slope and then open a parentheses, I can highlight my Y values, S over V naught. Oops. Type in comma, highlight my X values. There we go. Close those parentheses. That's my slope. So 0 0.0011 in this case. Notice that the trend line, the slope says 0 0.0013. So those values are going to be different because the plot is showing you the average values, right? When I calculate slope over here, it's just using these. So the plot is using these values. Right now, we're using these values. And so they could be different. At any rate, once we have slope, we can calculate Vmax. So that's going to be equals 1 forward slash, and then left click on this field. There we go. 861. That's my Vmax value. Again, watch your units. Um, they're different from the example that we just went over. Now it's nanomoles ONP per minute because that is the, uh, the, the, the units that we used for V0. Okay, we input V0 as nanomoles OMP per minute, so that's what Vmax should be. All right, and then we can do the same kind of analysis with KM. So here we type in equals intercept, open a parentheses, highlight those values for my Ys, these values for my Xs. Now, uh, be very careful here um, to always put your Ys in first and your Xs in seconds. If you do it backwards, so let's say you say equals slope, put your x's in first, and then your y's, you'll get the wrong value, okay? So always be very careful in that. Whatever's in your y-axis should be what you put into that command first. All right, so anyways, I know that b is equal to km over vmax, so that means that km must be equal to b times vmax, so I can come into here and say my KM is equal to that intercept that I just calculated times asterisk Vmax. And there we go. 1.6824. Alrighty. And now, if I want to, I can drag these equations across. But I'm going to have to put in some dollar signs, so everything that I want to stay fixed, for example, my x values up here for slope, I put dollar signs in front of them. There's nothing that needs to remain fixed for this cell. Again here, I'm going to put some dollars in front of the a's. Nothing that needs to be remain fixed here. All right, so now I can drag, oh, my equation's getting in the way. Here we go. I can drag these across. So look at here. Now I've got three different values for Vmax and three different values for Km. Again, you're going to see something like this. You're going to see uh, a little bit of wiggle, a little bit of variation in your estimates of Vmax and Km when you repeat these data. Um, this may very well be your first time doing an enzymatic reaction or your first time using a pipette. So you're going to make mistakes the first time, and you're going to get better at it as you go along. That's one source of variation or error in these measurements. Um, it could also be that the temperature in the room that we're in is warmer on one day compared to the next day. We don't have control over temperature. So if it's warmer, then the enzyme is going to work faster, and my Vmax is going to be higher. If it's colder, Vmax is going to be lower. Um, it's very important to keep that in mind because while we have done a very good job of creating a low cost system here, we have not introduced any temperature control whatsoever. So if this is something that you were to take out in the field or to use, let's say, for a lab uh, exercise, um, it might be worthwhile putting in some sort of heater slash cooler um, to regulate the temperature in that device to make sure that you don't see that type of error, that type of um, uh, shift in your Vmax and Km values. 
Or at the very least, maybe you just add a thermocouple and you're able to measure the temperature and you can anticipate changes in Vmax and Km. You know that if the measurement is occurring at a higher temperature than usual, Vmax is going to be higher. All right, so anyways, you're going to see error. This is part of life. I just want to make absolutely sure that you understand that. Um, all right, so then let's come over here and close this thing out. What I want you to report in your uh, report, your written report, is the average of these Vmax values and a standard deviation of those values. So in this case, for example, I'm just going to copy those formulas down here. I would want you to write in your report something that looks like this. Uh, we observed a maximum rate of reaction Vmax of in this case, let's say 795 plus or minus 59. And I know I did my rounding incorrectly there, um, but you get the basic idea. I need to see the average value, 795, plus or minus the standard deviation. And hopefully that standard deviation is going to be relatively small, um, less than 5 to 10 percent of your average value but report it nonetheless. Um, if it's a high standard deviation, I'd like you to comment on that and give me some reasons as to why you think that might have happened. Um, otherwise, if it's a low standard deviation, like I said, less than 5 to 10%, uh, like we have here, then you don't need to say anything more. All right, but we're not done yet. That needs to say 795 plus or minus 59 and the units nanomole ONP per minute. And something similar for Km, so a Km of 1 point, let's say, 68 plus or minus, <clears throat> oh gosh, that's a really low number, um, 0 0.0013 uh, um, eventually. Oh, huh. In this specific example, I've, I've given you data sets that have very similar Kms, so the standard deviation is very low. Huh. Well... Hopefully your data are that reproducible, but not necessarily. Um, you'll probably get something that's much higher here for standard deviation. Okay, <clears throat> so I think that's everything that I had for today. Um, yeah, that's it. So this is what we're going to do uh, next week. Is uh, I'd highly encourage you to have a sheet like this ready to go, where you've got tabs for your raw data. So you've got your three triplicates that you need to get for each of those data points, each of those substrate concentrations. And the sheet is set up in such a way that you can take the V naughts, the initial reaction rates from that data, and copy that over into this table of uh, michaelis mitten constants. So uh, your V naught values and your S's, and then plot those. And then you can automatically calculate S over V naught like we have shown here, and then make a haynes wolf plot. Because what I'd like to see in the report is a few things. I want to see a representation of your raw data, so something like this that shows you've got good initial reaction rates that are all linear. All right, So I need to see straight lines here, and I need to see that the uh, slope of those lines is increasing as you increase substrate concentration. I need to see a michaelis mitten plot that looks something like this. So it's a square hyperbola, has a plateau. And remember to put those error bars on here. So that's each of those points is an average of all the data points, plus or minus a standard deviation. And so you can use that plot, let me go back here, to estimate what Vmax is going to be, estimate what Km would be. And then over here on the Haynes Wolf plot, you give me a similar plot. And let's see, oops, come on, where we plot the average um, S over V naught values versus substrate concentration. You get this trend line in here that allows you to estimate the slope and the intercept. And, or alternatively, um, you can calculate slope and intercept over here. You get pretty much the same values, um, or sorry, slope and intercept, there's slope and there's intercept. And then you use those values to calculate Vmax and Km. 
And I want you to calculate a Vmax and Km for each batch of experimental data, average those together, and report the averages plus or minus the standard deviation. <clears throat> and like I said, you report that in the written report, um, but what I want you to do is take this a step further. I want you to check your work. So here we have a Vmax of 795, for example. Tie that back to your michaelis mitten plot. Okay, just to make sure you did your haynes wolf calculations correctly, you should be able to come back in here and say, all right, 795, well, maybe I did have an outlier here, and I hadn't reached my uh, Vmax yet, but you can see this is within reason. 800 is believable. If I had something that was like 8,000 for my Vmax, that doesn't make any sense. You probably got a, a decimal error somewhere there, because um, you're off by an order of magnitude. Likewise, Km, <clears throat> um, let's see, what do we get for Km? It was 1.68, so yeah, here, I really do think I've got an outlier there. Um, but 1.68 occurs about right here. If I were to look at this plot, I would think it would be closer to 0 0.75, but that would be based on a Vmax of 600, right? So if Vmax really is 800, then this curve should keep going up, and Km would actually be right shifted, okay? But that's what I want you to do, is I, I want you to take those Vmax and Km values and compare them to this plot. Um, just to show that you're thinking this through um, and checking for mistakes in your work. Okay, so I think that's about it. Um, let me know if you have any questions, either via email or during class. Um, but uh, yeah, this is Excel. It's a wonderful tool. Uh, you're going to see it over and over again. It can only make your life easier, so I highly encourage you to use it. And I'll end with this. Uh, just my final thought would be uh, if there's something that you want to do in Excel, some sort of analysis of numbers, or if you want to automate some sort of uh, calculation or something like that, there's a way to do it. There's always a way to do almost anything in Excel. I've just scraped the tip of the iceberg here, but if you just Google Excel and then whatever you want to do, there's going to be a video online that shows you how to do it. And if you take the time to uh, look that up first, and to figure out how to use Excel to automate some sort of data analysis, it will save you a load of time. So I highly encourage you to do that. Whenever you're trying to do something in Excel, go to Google, see how to do it faster, and it'll just make your life easier. All right. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you guys next week.